All right, I'm going to go ahead and assume this is recording. Um, welcome back. This is uh, Lecture 6.3, Powers of Congress. So we're going to look at the, the things that the Constitution delegates um, to Congress as both expressed powers and implied powers. It's important to note that, again, everything comes from the Constitution, whether it's been um, you know changed through amendment or whether it's been just built upon through tradition and through... Um, uh, through informal informal amendment, we've talked about that before. Uh, the big idea here is that uh, Congress, the powers of Congress, um, are far larger today than the framers had ever intended, and uh, there's significant debate as to whether or not that's good, bad, or otherwise. But uh, because that's the way it is, let's study them as they are and move forward. Uh, I'm going to warn you: this is um, this is um, 43 slides. And uh, pause, rewind as you need to, take breaks as you need to. This doesn't have to be all in one sitting. I'm going to try and make sure that this is under um, under three or uh, 30 minutes. Okay, so I've said it. Now let's roll. Um, all right, so this covers all of Chapter 11. As we look at the uh, main objectives that we're looking at here, uh, this covers them. Um, so pause, take a look at these before we go forward, and then come back when you're ready. All right, so when we consider the scope of congressional influence, I like this quote uh, from Senator Susan Collins, uh, who's a Republican from Maine. She says, the range of issues that come before the United States Senate is infinite, from ratifying treaties to confirming federal judges to appropriating the federal dollars that fund the programs upon which we all rely. Um, it is important to note, especially when we get to you know Chapter 12 and we look at Congress in action, they do consider thousands of bills every year, every session. And um, and and when you look at just just that, uh, that's a lot. Um, upwards of ten thousand bills, you know, in in a single year. However, they also have executive powers, judicial authorities, um, and and a number of other things that, when you break it all down, is just an impressive amount of responsibility. Um, so when we talk about our constitutional powers, let's just kind of get a review here of what expressed, implied, and inherent powers are, because um, that is that's 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 where all this stems from. So expressed powers are those that are explicit in specific wording, and uh, the graphic there on the right shows the expressed powers, um, primarily Article One, Section Eight. These come from your textbook. Uh, the implied powers. Um, this also comes from uh, section four, I believe, of your textbook. But it's it's the it's the things that are implied by reasonable deduction from the express powers, and um, and so the express power to link collect taxes means that um, you know Congress can punish tax evaders and regulate license and licenses and trade uh, and sale of commodities like alcohol and so on. And then the inherent powers are the things that. Um, that exists that Congress has because it's a national government that was created for the United States. Um, and so, you know, be, uh, being a member of the, the United Nations and um, setting immigration policy, those things are inherent. When we talk about how the Constitution sets um, congressional powers, I mentioned at the beginning that um, Congress's powers have expanded far beyond what the framers had intended. What we're referring to there is that um, at the at the outset there was two different viewpoints, two different interpretations of the Constitution. One was a strict construction, uh, and the other one was a liberal or a loose construction. A strict construction means that um, those that those that believed in a strict construction believe that Congress should be only able to exercise ex its express powers and those implied powers that are absolutely necessary to carry out those express powers. Um, Thomas Jefferson was the most um, ardent advocate for a strict construction at the beginning uh, of our you know, United States um, uh, beginnings. Um, he obviously um, had significant opponents. Um, the other idea, the other uh, interpretation is a liberal construction. What that really means is that it's a broad interpretation of the powers that are given uh, to Congress. Uh, and it calls for an energetic government, and an energetic government was absolutely needed at that time. 
which is why um, the framers created a national government to replace the Articles of Confederation. Um, and so these two viewpoints uh, were the ones that were battling at the beginning of, um, of our United States, and the liberal construction was the winner. Right? We still debate uh, as to you know how um, how um, we interpret the Constitution. Do we uh, consider the framers' original intent with judicial um, proceedings and so on? However, um, this loose and very broad interpretation has become our general consensus for um, what our Congress can and is able to do. All right, so we'll look at um, the first couple of powers of Congress here. Uh, money and commerce are the two really big ones. Okay, and we're referring to here our, um, oh, these are supposed to show up a little bit better. I know why. Gotcha. I put some builds and transitions in here, but obviously, well, not obviously, I'm not using that, so they didn't show up nicely. But anyways, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 2, Clause 3, and then Clause 5, give us the power to tax, power to borrow, uh, power to regulate trade and foreign commerce, and the power to coin money. Um, these are our significant constitutional expressed powers because, again, they're, they're, they're literally word for word from the Constitution. The Constitution clearly gives them to the Congress. They are expressed. So the power to tax is the first one, and a tax is a charge levied by government on persons or property to raise money to meet public needs or other purposes. These other purposes, uh, you know, we can look at the protective tariff uh, as being another purpose. Uh, protective tariff is is uh, discouraging um, buying foreign goods in order to encourage uh, buying uh, goods and products from from the United States. Um, the power to destroy is another one of those other purposes. Um, power to destroy means again that we're taxing in order to discourage. An activity or behavior. Uh, licensing is, is another way uh, for the government to regulate. Uh, it's another, it's, it's, it's an other purpose, uh, but in order, uh, by, but by Congress licensing certain activities and certain um, products, um, it allows them to have some regulation over it. And a license is a tax. There are four limitations as to um, what Congress can tax and not tax, uh, and those four are listed there. Um, must be for public purposes, um, may not tax exports, uh, and that's again a, a very strict um, um, no-no coming from Section 9 of Article 1. Uh, the third limitation is that direct taxes must be apportioned among the states according to population, uh, and that indirect taxes uh, must be at the same rate across the country. So we'll look at direct and indirect taxes here a little more closely. A direct tax is paid directly to the government by the person on whom it is imposed. Uh, property taxes, income taxes, poll taxes are all examples of a direct tax. Uh, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 um, uh, says that no uh, capitation or other direct tax, a capitation is like a per capita, uh, a tax on, on um, individuals uh, shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directly to be taken. Uh, and, and it was Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 that was kind of rescinded in the 16th Amendment. Uh, the income tax um, is allowed and, and is granted uh, to Congress. Um, income tax is an example of a direct tax. And so in order to provide an income tax, um, it had to be a constitutional amendment to change Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4. Conversely, an indirect tax is paid indirectly uh, to government. It's first paid by one person, but then passed on to another. Uh, it could be, pa <clears throat> when I say paid by one person, it could be paid by one business or an institution, and then passed on to another individual. Uh, a sin tax is an example of an indirect tax. Um, um, the tax is first paid uh, to the government by cigarette companies and then passed on to us and I say us very loosely um, but by those who smoke 
uh, or those that uh, you know uh, use other forms of tobacco, uh, when they when they buy it from a store, that tax has already been paid, but the store and the cigarette company are kind of getting their money back uh, from our tax. But there's fuel taxes and other tariffs. Uh, those are examples of indirect taxes. Sorry. Um, so moving on to the borrowing part then. Um, we want to look at some things here specifically with the borrowing power. Uh, clearly the Constitution allows Congress to borrow money. There are no limits or restrictions to you know how they can do that or what they can borrow money for or from. Uh, it has to be um, um, it has to be legitimate and that's something that we need to understand. Um, so uh, while there is no real constitutional limit, there is what we call a public debt. Um, Congress has established a ceiling or a cap as to how much debt can be incurred. Um, and recently, the last two years, we've seen that debt ceiling um, get kicked up and up and up, and it's just been ridiculously um, on the rise. However, it's important to note that in the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, Congress and President Clinton uh, vowed to eliminate deficit financing. Um, they, they vowed to eliminate, um, you know, increasing the public debt. Uh, their goal was realized much sooner than 1990, uh, by 2002, uh, the nation's economy was so robust at the time that the government's income rose dramatically. Um, and the Treasury reported a, a modest surplus for 1998, and then 1999, and then in 2000 and 2001. By 2002, you know, there, they had been a, a, there had been a four-year um, surplus. And uh, again, the economy was fantastic. The economy is good. People's incomes are high. When incomes are high, tax revenue is, is high also. Okay, and so... Um, the Balanced Budget Act of 1997 was a, was was a good good thing. However, it was also convenient. Um, so since 2002, we've seen a significant push back into deficit deficit financing or deficit spending. And deficit financing uh, saw its start here, um, really in the Great Depression. And then ever since then, uh, government has spent more. Then it has taken in in revenue pretty much every single year, um, with the simple exception of, of uh, 1998, 99, 2000, 2001. Uh, deficits are once again the order of the day. Uh, three major factors that combined to, to make those four years of budget surpluses only a brief interlude uh, were, were threefold, right? Three major factors. Number one, a sharp downturn in the economy. Number two, Several major tax cuts pushed by President Bush uh, that were enacted by Congress in 2001, 2002, 2003. Uh, those big tax cuts um, were great for the people at the time. Uh, they were intended to stimulate the economy, and they did. However, the third major factor was the onset of the global war on terrorism. And the ongoing conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq have been huge um, expenditures. And then even more recently... Um, huge expenditures on um, government bailouts of um, banking and financial institutions as well as uh, financing a federal health care plan. And so those are the three things um, that I just mentioned there. Moving on uh, to the commerce power. Uh, the commerce power refers to the power of Congress to regulate interstate uh, and foreign trade. Um, it was created out of a significant need, and we'll talk about needs as we go along here. Um, but the needs uh, of the of the thirteen original states immediately following the following the American Revolution um, uh, were such that the states uh, were unable to trade nicely with each other uh, because each state had its own significant needs. Uh, each state was sovereign and made its own decisions for itself. Uh, and in order to protect Virginia's um, you know, goods and services, and in order to protect Maryland's goods and services, uh, these states enacted protective measures which discouraged trade between them, and that wasn't good. Um, 
And so the commerce power was, was created out of that significant need. Gibbons Viagin was um, uh, the first uh, kind of challenge to the commerce power and the commerce clause. Gibbons Viagin was um, not only the first big challenge, but it was also the big, first big interpretation of how, how vast the commerce power was. In this court case, uh, which was um, over shipping rights, or not shipping rights, but um, transportation rights uh, in New York, right? The state had granted uh, one company uh, a monopoly over, um, you know, ferrying back and forth in this, um, over this body of water. I can't think of the name of the, of the body of water specifically. Um, I'm going to say it was um, uh, the Hudson River um, in New York. Um, yeah, it was the Hudson River. And uh, from New York to Albany, right? It was, it was up and down the Hudson River. Well, um, so New, the state of New York gave, gave Robert Fulton's uh, company rights to that. Robert Fulton gave them to a guy named... Um, um, Aaron Ogden. Uh, however, Thomas Gibbons was given a coasting license from the federal government. And um, so he had a conflict with Ogden because, or with Gibbons because these, sorry, Gibbons had a conflict with Ogden because one was stealing business from the other. One had believed that they had had a monopoly over uh, the ferrying rights up and down the Hudson River. Uh, and so when they came to the Supreme Court, the big question was, um, uh, that you know, the, the New York grant conflicted with the congressional power to regulate commerce, and the court agreed. Right, commerce, as defined by uh, Chief Justice uh, John Marshall, commerce is, is intercourse. It's not just buying and selling things. It's 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 moving, and and um, this definition hugely expanded the congressional reach of what they could regulate and what they, uh, what they could um, kind of control and dominate. So we look at the commerce power of work since then. Uh, it's been used to break up corporate monopolies. It's been used to regulate all the industries, industries you see there, trucking, railroad, shipping, airline, so on and so forth. I, I got my, my, my um, on and on and on. It really has vastly expanded what um, Congress has uh, has an ability to touch um, because again it's not just buying and selling things it's also commercial intercourse and the relationship between companies that translates uh, across state lines and, and international lines if you can hear that now is it's my uh, it's my it's my water softener uh, I'm not sure why it's so loud it's not that late. It's only 12.30. It's supposed to come on later. So, sorry about that. There are four significant limitations to the commerce power. Commerce cannot, um, Congress cannot tax imports. Or, hmm, let me start over. Congress's commerce power has four limitations. Number one, it cannot tax exports. Number two, it cannot favor ports of one state over another in regulation of trade. Number three, it cannot require that vessels that are bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. Um, um, when you license one vehicle in one state, that's enough. Uh, there's no need to license or, um, uh, uh, like, you know, semi trucks that travel interstate borders. Um, they have one license that is that, that allows them to be a, 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 a uh, an out of state um, vehicle, and it's not bound to any one necessarily state one necessary state uh, often. And the fourth one is that it couldn't interfere with the slave trade until 1808. It's a moot point now, uh, but that was part of that weird uh, slave trade compromise at the Constitutional Convention. So moving on to the, uh, the currency power, uh, again, the currency power was created out of need. After the American Revolution uh, and that interim period between the, uh, the end of the revolution and you know, prior to the Constitutional Convention, 
Um, each state had its own sovereign ability to create uh, its own currency. Um, the national government did have at the time uh, a desire to coin money and provide a, a national uh, system of, of currency. However, each state did the same thing. So uh, post-revolutionary America was a currency free-for-all. Uh, there was very little hard coinage available. Um, and whatever you know, paper currency was made was uh, quickly devalued. Uh, partly because foreign coins held their value, right? The British pound, uh, Spanish, whatever it was, still floated around, and, uh, and they were still very valuable. And, and um, when compared to these cheap paper dollars uh, that were printed, um, you know, they obviously held a high hand. Uh, the framers all agreed that when we look at the need for currency, uh, it was essential for them to have a single national system of hard money. A true, um, true coin currency, and that's why when we look at the express currency power, it is the power to coin money. And we get into later, uh, did that really mean that they could have paper dollars? We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so under the new constitution, no states could issue currency, um, and so this congressional stability uh, was added to the monetary system because of this currency power. And then warnings to heed. See, I have this kind of this rhyming thing system going on here. Catch that. Um, you know, who can and should issue money? What we really understand, we need to understand there is that um, state states gave banks the power uh, to issue currency, and that 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 lasted actually until the uh, the middle to late 1800s when Congress finally said we're going to start taxing uh, and putting a tax on state currency or state bank currency. Um, and so those disappeared. Uh, legal tender is the term that describes any kind of money that is uh, that a creditor must, by law, accept in payment for any debt. Um, and so when we look at a dollar bill, it actually says this is legal tender on it. Um, and uh, all of our coins are considered to be legal tender. The bankruptcy power is another express power that we looked at a minute ago. Um, Bankruptcy is a legal proceeding in which the bankrupt's assets are distributed among those to whom a debt is owed. Uh, it's a wiping of this uh, of the slate to create a clean slate for anyone that is um, declaring for bankruptcy. Congress holds power to determine regulations for all bankruptcy and proceedings are usually held in national courts. Uh, Congress also has uh, formulations and war powers uh, that are given to them. Um, we're kind of working our way into the implied powers here. Um, um, these powers are shared with the president. Right? The president has um, expressed power to um, negotiate treaties. Um, the president has the power to um, uh, to be, you know, commander in chief. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so these formulation powers, though, even though they're shared with the president, they come from the express powers of war. Right? Congress has the express power to declare war and um, to regulate foreign commerce. And so it's implied that the Congress has the ability to share some powers of the president here. It allows the Congress to check um, the war powers that the president has. Uh, it also comes from the inherent need to act as the lawmaking body of a sovereign nation in order for uh, protection and defense it's important to understand that Congress should have some ability to um, um, stretch its ability to oversee presidential um, um, use of the Army and Navy. So the president is commander-in-chief, however, only Congress can declare war, only Congress can raise and support armed forces and calling forth the militia. These things are um, express powers. Uh, Congress can make rules for capture. And then through the War Powers Resolution from 1973, uh, Congress has um, uh, significantly increased its ability to restrict what the president can do in times of peace. There are other express powers uh, that we see um, c that Congress has. Uh, naturalization, uh, creating a postal service, and not just a postal service, but creating roads uh, that 
postal services are to, are to operate on. Also, over intellectual property, um, copyright and patents are, are important pieces that have allowed our um, our economy and our free market and uh, in, in free enterprise system um, uh, to be something more than just you know a system where machines are made and they produce things. Uh, protecting innovation, protecting invention, uh, by allowing individuals to capitalize on that has encouraged innovators uh, to work in such a way that allows them to be uh, pushing the boundaries of what we're able to do. Uh, other countries can't claim that, primarily because they don't have protection of, of intellectual property. Other expressed powers that Congress has, um, uh, power over territories and other areas, uh, the idea with eminent domain is a big one. Uh, that Congress can take private property for public use. Uh, there's been a clause that is added to that uh, that, with, that requires them to to compensate those uh, private individuals for property they're taking. But if Congress needs to um, uh, to establish a highway, the highway probably is going to cut through private property, and um, and Congress will pay individuals. Uh, for the property that they are taking and assuming to cut that road. Um, I do want to go back real quick uh, to the commerce power. And see, as Congress, um, as Congress, uh, back here, as Congress uh, opened up opportunities for the steamboat tra uh, you know, shipping uh, and transportation, at the same time, the railroad industry was starting, just starting to boom and, and expand. Right, steam power was was the thing of the day, and so when, um, as Congress opened up, that there is there can be no monopolies on shipping of, of one waterway. Uh, similarly, there can be no monopoly on shipping over railroads, uh, and so as railroads go across state borders, Congress can say, you have to, you have to allow other railroad companies um, you know same same access and uh, and so that created a huge amount of competition which again spurred innovation and spurred uh, reduced rates and, and everything that for um, for those transportation industries um, to really to really reach higher heights than they had been before so um, Congress also has some express powers over um, uh, that are judiciary in nature. Um, we'll talk about uh, the investigative powers of Congress here a little bit too. But creating a federal court system was one of the first things that Congress did in 1789, uh, establishing a Supreme Court and other federal courts. Uh, they also have the ability to determine punishment for violators of federal laws. You know, if you, if you crash a mailbox or if you... Um, um, uh, or are convicted of treason, Congress has the intended for those. All right, so here we go. Moving specifically then into the implied powers, right? The implied powers kind of come and stem from Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eighteen. This is known as the Necessary and Proper Clause because of this phrase right here. Okay, uh, it's also called the Elastic Clause because it has been. Um, used to stretch the power of Congress um, in directions that are, were unforeseen um, to our founding fathers. So when I say stretchy, I go back to one specific court case uh, that made it clear exactly what it meant to be necessary and proper. Uh, again, Chief Justice John Marshall argued in McCullough versus Maryland, that uh, you know, we admit, as all must admit, that the powers of government are limited and that the, its limits are not to be transcended. But we think of the sound construction, and again, sound interpretation of the Constitution, must allow to the national legislature that discretion with respect to the means by which the powers of it confers, the powers it confers are to be carried into execution, which will enable that body to perform the high duties assigned to it in the manner most beneficial to the people. If you restrict Congress too much, it's useless, and that's that's his um, that's his opinion there. Um, he followed that up with a statement that said, 
um, um, uh, you know, he said, let the end be legitimate, let it be within the scope of the Constitution, and all means which are appropriate, which are plainly adapted to that end, which are not prohibited, prohibited, but consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, are constitutional. You know, what can Congress do? What is necessary and proper? Right? Let the end be legitimate. Let the means fit the end. Uh, and let those means not be against the, you know, constitutional, constitution. Um, um, those things, those things allow Congress to do what it needs to do. And, uh, and so when we think of the implied powers, uh, really what we need to understand is that if that's the case, then we need to look at the express powers a little bit differently, right? So here is uh, that, that same um, graphic that I showed you at the very beginning, uh, first couple of slides. The express part of the league collect taxes means we can punish tax evaders. We can regulate the sale uh, of some commodities. We can require states to meet certain conditions to qualify for federal funding. We can we can use our tax power um, to encourage and punish. Uh, so if we can regulate commerce, right, which is uh, which is over here. Okay. If we can regulate, regulate commerce, that means we can establish a minimum wage. We can uh, we can ban discrimination in workplaces and, and uh, public facilities. We can pass laws protecting the disabled. We can regulate banking. These are significant, uh, you know, expressions of express powers, right? That's that's what it really means to imply. So freed by loose construction, Congress uh, has opened up a lot of opportunities for giving money for particular uses and that that's appropriation uh, you know using money um, you know to say okay so we're going to provide money to the states uh, and if uh, if the states want this money they have to do this if um, if the states don't do this then you know um, or if states you know uh, if the states pass laws um, that uh, let's say, you know, okay, so for instance, um, setting a, a drinking age to be 21. Um, if states don't pass a law to, uh, uh, to mandate the, you know, 21 to be a drinking age, um, then we are not going to give states federal funds for highways, right? That's a, that's a way to use appropriation. Um, it's a stretch on the commerce power. Uh, so the doctrine then of implied powers is that principle or fundamental policy of loose interpretation of the Constitution that has become our consensus. Okay. So what else can Congress do? Well, Congress can propose amendments. Uh, Congress, by you know, according to Article Five, has uh, it can by two thirds vote, uh, you know, say that they'd like to change the Constitution. Uh, proposal is just the first step. The second step is ratification. Congress cannot ratify. Um, proposal of, of amendments has occurred 33 times. Um, one of the ways that Congress can propose an amendment is to call for a convention of two-thirds of the states. That has never happened. Um, um, but proposal of amendments is one of those important congressional powers. Um, it's non-legislative in nature, right? Uh, another non-legislative uh, power is, is electoral duties or responsibilities. Um, House and Senate have, have kind of specific responsibilities for uh, electing president and vice president. According to the 12th Amendment, uh, if, if no um, presidential candidate wins a majority, um, the House, by simple majority, which is, you know, voting by state, uh, so... All of Virginia's delegation, all of Michigan's delegation, uh, kind of cast, you know, one single collective vote, and a simple majority of the states then declares um, a presidential victor, and that's been that's occurred twice. This first one, Thomas Jefferson, occurred uh, prior to the Twelfth Amendment. Uh, the election of John Quincy Adams was uh, after the Twelfth Amendment. The Senate, similarly under similar circumstances, can elect a vice president. 
um, vice president is the acting uh, president of the Senate, so that makes sense. Uh, when the Senate votes that way, though, they vote as individuals. Uh, and so currently that would require 51 votes in order to elect a vice president in that manner. Um, um, so successors uh, are replacements in case, um, you know, for instance, if, uh, if a vice president were to um, resign, which has happened actually uh, once, uh, and the other time was a, uh, was a, was a fill-in. So um, when, um, when, okay, so before Richard Nixon resigned, uh, his vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned. And so Gerald Ford was um, uh, was nominated for the vacancy, and um, that had to be confirmed um, by both houses of Congress to fill that vacancy. Um, so when Nixon resigned as president, Gerald Ford stepped in as president because that's the presidential succession. And so he needed to then determine who his vice president was going to be. And so he chose Nelson Rockefeller in 1974. Again, both House and the Senate had to confirm um, uh, both of those individuals. Uh, another big thing that the Congress uh, does is, is impeachment. Uh, the House votes for impeachment. To impeach means to accuse or bring formal charges against um, against a president, the vice president, and any, any other civil officer, right? Um, uh, members of, of the uh, federal court system um, are subject to impeachment as well. So the House accuses uh, someone of, of um, um, you know, treasons, uh, um, treason, bribery, or other high crime or misdemeanor. Uh, that's what that's what the Constitution says regarding uh, impeachment. So the House brings those formal charges against uh, an individual, and the Senate acts like a court, uh, and then uh, the Senate will vote uh, whether or not that that person is convicted uh, of that of that crime of those charges, and that is has to be a conviction of a two thirds vote. Uh, twice, uh, a president has been um, brought to the Senate for conviction of of, of impeachment. Um, and uh, on both of those circumstances, uh, the Senate has voted to acquit, um, um, uh, found them not guilty of, of those crimes. Uh, the two presidents uh, was Andrew Johnson, uh, who was the 17th president uh, in 1860, um, 1867, and then Bill Clinton was the second president um, to have been impeached, and then uh, to be acquitted by the Senate. So there have been 17 impeachments overall, you know, two presidents, uh, seven convictions. Uh, those Of those seven convictions, all of them were federal judges. For more on um, Clinton and Johnson's impeachment process, uh, refer to this graphic. Pause the video, take a look at it. Uh, you have two questions that um, will require you to have uh, looked at this and used this. Uh, as you're looking at this, I want to talk about um, the word censure, right? So even though President Bill Clinton was um, acquitted, uh, it was it was let's see, it was uh, strongly requested that um, that uh, the Senate resolve to censure the president, which which means that it's it's a formal condemnation of his behavior, right? They, they, he wasn't um, found guilty. Um, of perjury or, or um, you know, other wrongdoing. However, um, um, you know the Senate did come out and say that his conduct was deplorable and, and should be condemned. Um, so uh, that's an important aspect of, of the Senate's job. The Senate also has some executive powers. Uh, or um, Sorry, the Senate confirms or approves presidential appointments. Um, the president has so many uh, you know, uh, um, individuals that have to be um, you know, named for um, uh, diplomats and um, you know, um, 
federal judge positions and uh, other officials within um, his cabinet. Uh, all of those positions have to be confirmed by the Senate. Senatorial courtesy is one of those things that, uh, you know, we need to understand that the Senate rarely, rarely blocks uh, a presidential nomination. However, if the person that the president nominates for a position um, um, is, dis is disagreed upon by members of his own party that are from the state that the nomination comes from, uh, the Senate will more than likely say, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to not confirm that. Um, so, um, you know, there have been there have been 600 cabinet appointments, you know, in, in the uh, cabinet department positions. Uh, and of those 600 cabinet appointments, only 12 uh, have been rejected at this point. So it, it's rare that it happens, but, um, you know, the Senate, the Senate provides, uh, you know, the Senate gives the president uh, possibilities for, for nomination. Um, the president will almost always go with, you know, what the Senate provides him. Um, but if the members of the president's own party from the state of the nomination, co you know, uh, nomination comes from, uh, if they disagree with that, then, then the whole Senate will disagree. Uh, similarly, the president has the ability to uh, to make treaties. Uh, that's that's the constitutional job of the, of the president. We'll talk about that in um, in a later chapter. Uh, however, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee provides counsel for those treaties uh, and for the State Department and. Um, the Senate is the, obviously the, the, the gives the final the final approval on all of those uh, negotiations. The Senate and the House also have investigatory power uh, or investigative power, um, and the, the, these questions of wh why um, is is kind of is kind of valid here, right? Um, so take a look at the uh, the reasons why um, Congress has investigative abilities. Um, and it makes us see why maybe uh, Iron Man was investigated by the Senate, um, you know, for having this weapon suit. So, so in summary, um, the next uh, three slides here take a look at all the things that we've accomplished. Right? Um, when we when we go back to our objectives, things that we wanted to accomplish here. Um, we can make the connections between all the things that we are we, we sought out to do in this and compare them to what have we done. Right? So Congress has only those powers that are delegated to it by the Constitution and how those powers should be interpreted and applied have been sharply debated throughout history. We've talked about that. The framers give Congress taxing power, commerce power, very hugely important powers that um, they were based out of need because the Articles of Confederation didn't give the national government those powers. Uh, Congress has the vital power also to borrow money and to create a monetary system for the country. Again, those are need-based. Congress shares power with the president in both defense and foreign affairs. Congress regulates several matters that affect everyday life, including such things as mail, weights, measures, copyrights, and patents. Congress has a number of important powers that aren't set up by the Constitution, uh, but instead are implied. And what Congress can and cannot do in the exercise of its implied powers has been, again, debated. Congress may propose amendments uh, to the Constitution. The House uh, can decide presidential elections. Uh, the House has the power to impeach or accuse. Um, and the Senate can remove officials. The Senate has the power to confirm or reject major presidential appointments and approve or reject treaties. And Congress may investigate any matter that falls within the scope of, leg of its legislative powers. All right, so we've done lots. I'm going to bed. It's, it's, I'm tired. Hopefully this has been helpful for you. I wish you all a fantastic time finishing um, your Chapter 11 uh, work.